who um, graduated from Alfred 25 years ago, which I really can't believe. Um, she uh, was a double major biology and environmental studies. I think I'm remembering that correctly. Yep. And um, then got a, a master's degree in education at Alfred um, and moved back to her home state of Maine where she's been doing some really amazing stuff and um, is the, and I, I'm so excited to hear about um, the work she's doing now as the sustainability coordinator for the uh, University of New England. Um, so uh, she's gonna tell us all about that and I'm gonna turn it over to her. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, um, Michelle's been asking me for a couple of years to come back to do the environmental seminar series. And I also run a small hobby farm with dairy goats and it's kind of hard this time of year to get away. <clears throat> um, so I guess one advantage of COVID is I get to see you all virtually instead. So this, this works for, for me in terms of format pretty well at this time of year. Um, so I'm gonna do a share screen and try to get my PowerPoint up for all of you. Um, let's see if this is gonna work. <clears throat> All right. Stick this over there. Um, and I guess there's a format for questions um, after um, the slide deck. So if everybody can just hold their questions and then we'll um, give an opportunity. I, my presentation's probably about 35 minutes long because I wanted to make sure that I had ample opportunity for people to ask questions. Um, but I wanted to start off with giving a little bit of background information about the University of New England. We have um, two campuses in Maine and one in Morocco. That first picture was actually a, an image of our Morocco campus, which was created several years ago to create, um, to help our science students. We were very strong in the health sciences field to give them a global education experience um, without having to do a fifth year, which is often the case um, or an extra semester at some institutions. Um, but Maine is a leading provider of health profession graduates in Maine. Um, and we're Maine's only medical school and Northern New England's only dental school. Um, and we're a national leader in interprofessional healthcare education. On, for our on-campus student headcount last year was uh, just under 4,500 students and we have another 7,700 of online students. So we have a, a pretty robust online program now as well. And our most popular um, populist undergraduate majors include biological sciences, marine sciences, psychology, and the pre-health professional programs like athletic training and pre-PT um, and nutrition and public health. <clears throat> so my typical internal presentation that would cover sort of all of the sustainability measures in a sort of did you know fashion but I really thought that it would be more appropriate to organize today's talk in a way that categorized um, some of the examples of sustainability initiatives by how we've gotten them done and what might be the points of leverage <clears throat> that we've employed to make um, some progress. Um, and I thought they could kind of be broken down in the following manner with, um, you know, from the sustainability office and funding, student advocacy, research and teaching, and, and some of the councils. Um, and of course, there's subcategories within each of these. And I'm, I'm just gonna give some examples that fit into each one of these categories. Um, it's by no means an inclusive list. Um, there's so much more going on that there's no way I could capture it in 50 minutes, so. So, Beginning the journal, the journey for me anyway, um, really came about as um, the Environmental Council was formulated a couple of years before I came to the University of New England um, <clears throat> and put some pressure on the former president of the university to sign something called the American College and Universities President's Climate Commitment. So it's the ACU PCC for short. And um, Dr. Ripich um, was the president at the time and she really wanted some metric to base her decision upon 
um, and they decided that the um, that metric would be a carbon footprint analysis. The Environmental Council sort of convinced her that um, it would be better than um, hiring an outside consulting firm to do a carbon footprint analysis instead to hire a sustainability coordinator to do that, that inventory and also do some other sustainability initiatives like creating a um, more robust recycling program and things like that. So, um, and she agreed. So they developed the sustainability coordinator position, which has now morphed. It originated as a half-time temporary contract. And over the past 12 years, it has developed into full-time permanent and um, have a title change for assistant director of sustainability at this point. <clears throat> the, um, the very first thing that I was sort of hired to do was that greenhouse gas emissions inventory. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to um, just show you, this is a table after a whole bunch of work, but um, our very first one, um, the tools that we've employed over the many years, um, and this is something that I have to do annually is the greenhouse gas emissions inventory. But the original one was something called the campus carbon calculator. It was um, maintained by Clean Air Cool Planet. It was a massive Excel-based spreadsheet that captured um, lots of information from um, miles traveled um, that the university funds to for, for air travel, for student, faculty, and staff commuting, for all of the paid transportation, whether it was mileage reimbursement, um, solid waste, um, and any of our fuels that we've burned, whether it was oil, propane, natural gas, we burn all of them, <laughs> um, and you know, fleet transportation, and then our electricity that we consume. It morphed over the years and um, it, the, the format that it was collected and was called the, or the, the tool was called Carbon Map and it was maintained by um, the UNH Sustainability Institute. So that was the first move to a web-based platform. And then most recently in the last couple of years, they've moved to um, SIMAP, which stands for Sustainability Indicator Management and Analysis Platform. It's still maintained by UNH, um, but it includes the nitrogen footprint tool. But each one of these moves to different tool have represented updates in emissions factors um, and in accounting methodologies and analysis platforms. Um, and I wanted to note um, with this next graph, so this is a more recent um, reporting structure <clears throat> that shows the difference between the tool, the original tool, Campus Cal Carbon Calculator that we were originally using, and then the purple line with um, the sign with, um, actually that one's the um, carbon map. Um, but during this period of time, um, we, we actually saw roughly 30% increase between 2010 and 2017 in our on-campus population. UNE has grown leaps and bound, bounds over the last decade. Um, during that time, we also saw about a 27% increase in gross square footage. Um, and during that period, we only saw a 15% increase in our emissions. So even though um, Dr. Ripich signed on to the um, president's climate commitment, <clears throat> we actually haven't truly seen a reduction in emissions. It's been um, more of a stabilizing of emissions, I would say. Um, since I came to UNE in 2008, we've um, constructed, I think, 12 new buildings and added a couple of um, major renovations that expanded um, sort of mothballed spaces. Um, so so we've, we've grown considerably. Um, when I came to UNE, we were pretty close to the size of Alfred, actually. And, and like I said, now we're, we're pretty, pretty large. Um, I don't want to focus too much on greenhouse gas emissions because I, I could spend a whole day just <laughs> talking about that. Um, but needless to say, um, it was enough to convince Dr. Ripich to go ahead and sign on to the ACU PCC. It's now called the Carbon Commitment, which I'm thankful for because it's a lot easier to say. Um, 
that carbon commitment requires us to produce um, or to do an annual greenhouse gas emissions inventory um, and also to produce a climate action plan every five years. So we've, um, we've produced two of those so far. Um, in that climate action plan, we've set our own carbon neutral date of 2040. Um, and it also has required that we set interim target reductions. <clears throat> so in our 2017 um, climate action plan, we have a, an interim target of 20, um, 2021 at about 18,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Um, we actually reached that this past fiscal year, um, but I will say that it was in large part because of the pandemic and because it represented avoided increase with limited growth, um, not necessarily huge reductions that, that we've um, you know, done super intentionally. Um, and I have included um, a link here on the slide deck, which I can pass along to Michelle and she can make folks uh, make it available to folks if they're interested um, after the talk um, that would bring you to both the 2010 and the 2017 climate action plans. But I wanted to just very quickly summarize um, two thoughts. <laughs> Um, through the process of, of authoring these, um, these two climate action plans. One thing that we have done exceptionally well, I think, is in engaging stakeholders in the development of the, of the climate action plans um, at all levels of decision making. Um, and it's really important to do that because there are, there are two really essential elements to reducing um, carbon footprint and increasing sustainability of an, at an institutional level. Um, one of them, obviously, is having administrative prioritization um, is really important, obviously. But the other piece is, um, is really changing individual behaviors. Um, a lot of the scope three emissions, such as waste and transportation, um, address individual behaviors, especially. Um, so engaging stakeholders at all levels um, is, is very important. And I think that we've done that very well, especially in the, the latest, in the 2017 update. The, the part that I feel like we haven't done great with is um, you really do need um, some engineering help um, to come up with an emissions reduction roadmap that's feasible. And that is something that I would say that we've been lacking in. We don't have that expertise in house um, and we've had to rely on, um, you know, contractors to, to come in and provide those, you know, if this, then this scenario. Um, so that's something that the next um, iteration of the climate action plan, I know we're going to have to do better at because we're getting very close to our 2040 um, even though it seems like it's still a ways out, you know, we're, we're a third of the way there in our time frame. So, so I, I thought I'd give you um, some ideas about funding, and this is sort of sustainability on a shoestring. The University of New England is a very young institution. We have a very, very small endowment. Um, and so having a lot of funding specifically geared towards sustainability really hasn't at any point been um, something that we've enjoyed. Um, so, so we've had to look for money in different ways. Um, one of the very early successes after when I first came to UNE in 2008 and did our first greenhouse gas emissions inventory and wrote our climate action plan the very next thing that I sort of set out to do was um, write a couple of grants. And in 2010, I, um, I wrote three grants. Um, June 5th was an, an interesting day of that year. Um, and they were all to the um, Efficiency Main Trust, which is a quasi state agency. It's governed by a board of trustees, but it has oversight from the Maine Public Utilities Commission. Um, and the rebates and grants that are funded come from a combination of um, revenue from REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, 
as well as electric and natural gas ratepayer um, conservation charges on monthly bills. So they provide incentives and um, for commercial and industrial as well as residential um, rebates. So I submitted the idea of, of these three grant um, projects to our vice president of campus operations. And his, in his infinite wisdom, he thought, yeah, well, maybe we'll get one of them. So he signed all three of the grant um, <laughs> projects. And then lo and behold, a few weeks later, we found out that we were funded for all three of them. Um, so it took a little bit of finagling in terms of structuring the timeline for each one of these so that we could actually afford the matching requirement. Um, but this is sort of what we did with it. Um, we had the building automation control project. Um, this was a $308,000 project that had 50% matching funds from Efficiency Maine. It addressed demand controlled ventilation, variable speed drives, direct digital controls, mixing valve modifications, hot water reset modifications. It touched 13 of our buildings on the Biddeford campus um, and it had a 13 month capital recapture period on our investment. So, so our match to it was about $104,000. Um, but we recoup that in savings in the first 13 months. So just a little over a year, um, we got that back in savings. And um, this is one of those projects that, the way that I characterize it, it's very unsexy, um, not flashy at all, no one noticed. It happened behind the scenes, um, you know, in the, in the walls and in the electrical equipment of, the, of each one of these buildings. But it, it was incredibly um, efficient in terms of the savings. You know, um, 13 month capital recapture period is, is a really great um, return on investment. The second grant application um, was for this LED parking lot lights. Now, you know, keep in mind that now LEDs are sort of the standard. Um, but in 2010, they, it was still somewhat new-ish technology. Um, and they were very expensive still. Um, the, the price now has come down considerably, but back then it really wasn't. Um, this was a $69,000 project. Um, again, it had 50% matching funds from Efficiency Maine. And it retrofitted um, the parking lot lights in eight of our parking lots on the Biddeford campus. Um, not quite as fast of a turnaround in terms of savings. It was more like, and not quite three years, it was two, a little over two and a half years of a capital recapture period. So um, again, not super sexy, but it was um, a, a pretty good return on the investment and a you know, good investment. Um, and then the third project was a solar thermal system on our campus center. This was really our first um, foray into anything with solar. Um, the project cost was about 102,000 um, and we had a little less than 50% match from Efficiency Maine. Um, this had a much, much longer um, return, close to eight years, um, but it's super iconic and visible, um, was one of those, they agreed to include it because it balanced out and it got, it, it provided us the ability to talk about the other two projects that had way bigger savings, um, both financially and in terms of energy. It, it provided us that opportunity to talk about those more invisible changes that we were making because this was right on the campus center. It replaced um, the propane fuel that was used to heat the domestic hot water in that building at the time that the grant project happened, that building housed our entire athletic department, um, including the pool um, and um, basketball and volleyball courts and fitness center and all that, as well as a retail dining location with a kitchen, a full kitchen. Um, since then, we've had a large athletic facility that has been built and our demand for domestic hot water in that building has significantly decreased the original grant application did not allow us to heat the pool, um, but we have since 
um, reconfigured the system so that any waste heat can actually be um, used to heat the pool since the demand has decreased so much in that building. So that, that I would say was the very beginning of finding any money um, was through, through grants. And I was actually thinking about my first foray into grant writing was actually the Argus mini grants. Um, and, and so this was sort of a nice coming home <laughs> um, was to work on these grant projects and, and manage those. Um, but we've done other things as well um, through donations. We have um, a new, in about a year and a half ago, we had a, a new solar um, system. And this is a PV um, photovoltaic system that is on our Marine Science Center. So you, in that picture there, you can see the Marine Science Center has got um, sort of two wings and it faces out into the Saco River. Um, there's 54 panels on um, the roof of those two wings. Um, this project was about $48,000, so still not, not a huge solar system, um, and, um, but we did this with a $25,000 donation from um, a gentleman that sort of just stepped forward. He actually has no ties to the University of New England. He just really wanted to um, sort of donate and invest in a carbon reducing measure. Um, but, but this also was happening at a time um, toward the very end of a fiscal year and there really wasn't um, any money that the university had set aside because this sort of came out of nowhere and it was expected that it would happen very quickly. Um, so we approached undergraduate student government and they um, agreed to provide a $15,000 um, contribution toward the project. Um, which was a really nice way of the students sort of putting their money where their mouth is and really just going for it and saying, yes, this is important to us. Um, so they used their own um, student fees um, to, to fund that to some, to some degree. And then we used um, another, the last $8,000 from something called the Green Revolving Fund, which I'm going to talk about in just a second. Um, so again, you know, solar electric does not have um, the same payback period um, as solar thermal does um, still, I would say. Um, we've got this project is about a 21 year return on investment. Um, but for our investment portion of it, um, it's only about a 10 year um, turnaround. So, and then the last thing is this thing called the Green Revolving Fund. Um, and that is, it's just an accounting mechanism where money can roll over in an account from year after, to, from year to year. Um, and it's typically challenging to do that with any budget for a nonprofit, which the University of New England is, it's a private nonprofit. Um, so we had to kind of jump through some accounting uh, loops or hoops to, to get to this. Um, but Dr. Ripich, our former president, um, did seed this with an initial $25,000 in 2015. Um, and it has grown now to just about a little over $70,000 um, through mainly through donations and rebates from the Efficiency Main Trust. So um, we have built into the, um, the procedure in terms of how the Green Revolving Fund uh, funds are used where it can capture some of those rebates in order to grow the fund um, rather than just paying the fund back for what it has borrowed, but to actually increase the, the amount of funding that we have available so that it's then available to do the next energy efficiency project. And this is a really important tool um, because oftentimes, like I was saying before with the, with the, um, solar system on the uh, Marine Science Center is that we often find ourselves with these amazing opportunities, whether a grant comes up or a donor comes forward, and it's not at a point in our budget cycle where we could normally take advantage of it. Um, so to be able to have some money that is a little bit easier to access um, sitting there and ready for us to be able to use for energy efficiency projects is kind of key. Um, so, um, and then I had talked about councils um, and the, the 
main one in terms of campus sustainability is called the Environmental Council. And again, this was a group um, that existed before the sustainability position existed at UNE and they were really responsible for bringing the sustainability position into, into being. But it's, it's very unique in its composition and in its duty. It's the only committee at UNE that is composed of faculty, staff, and students. Um, most of our committees are, are either very student oriented or faculty oriented or staff, professional staff oriented. And this is really the only one that takes all three of those constituents and brings them together. It's completely volunteer. So um, this is folks that are sort of donating their time and are passionate and committed um, and that come together and meet on a monthly basis during the academic year. We don't, don't meet during the, during the summer. Um, but the other thing that's really unique about this is that it is a completely volunteer um, committee, but it has a direct line of communication with the president of the university. So we have two co-chairs um, and they meet with the president twice a year just to talk about sustainability priorities. And it's something else that is, is I think somewhat unique in this is that I am not one of the co-chairs and I never have been and I never will be. So it was really important that the Environmental Council sort of have its own, um, uh, have its own representation from all of those constituents that sort of wasn't a paid professional. Um, and it's worked really well. It, it has meant that um, instead of sort of me having this special interest um, because I'm paid to pay attention to sustainability at the institution. Instead, the president gets to hear from, you know, a faculty and staff or student member, whoever has been elected as co-chair for that, for those year, year or two term, that they can talk directly to him. Um, and, and then the other piece that is unique is in their duty. Um, there's no budget. Um, and it's totally just advocacy and recommendation powers only. So oftentimes, and, and the, I suppose it can be a little bit frustrating sometimes because we've got great ideas and we can bring them forward. The co-chairs can present them to the president. And if it meets with, um, you know, Dr. Herbert's our current um, president of UNE right now. And if it meets with his um, agenda and his priorities, um, then he can find us the money or, or encourage institutional advancement or, um, you know, or the business office to work with us to find, find those funds. Um, and we've, we've enjoyed a lot of success that way, actually. Um, so we, we get things done in, in that way. Um, and just to give you just a small sampling of the types of projects that we've endorsed over um, the last several years, um, well, other than the first being um, them advocating for a sustainability um, position, let's see, was um, the launching of this um, water initiative. So one of our environmental council members sort of had this epiphany at one point walking through um, some offices in one of our buildings and realizing how many bubblers we had um, on campus and by the time we did the inventory and this is where the environmental council you know it's kind of weird that we're all just volunteers but we sort of just split both of the campuses up and people started um, taking note of where all of these Poland spring bubblers you know the ones that the five gallon glug 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 jugs um, we had 72 of them between our two campuses um, on <laughs> one floor of of DeCary Hall there were actually seven of them um, stashed away in offices. So we were actually purchasing over 17,000 gallons of water every year. Um, and then just recognizing that there was a more sustainable way to do this. And in most cases, we've saved money by, we lease these things called the Blue Reserve um, units. And it's filtered water, it's a nine stage filtration system. Um, and it does hot and cold water and they're super high efficient, they're LG um, units. And it really has been about changing social norms around single use wa bottled water. And um, it's 
I, I would say, well, until COVID, it was more unusual to see bottled water in people's hands than it was to see, you know, reusable water bottles. One of the next initiatives that, um, that I wanted to just talk about was electric vehicle chargers. <clears throat> this kind of started as a pie in the sky with only a few electric vehicle owners um, on, on one campus. And it's grown in just the last four years. We now have eight chargers with 12 designated parking spaces. There's over 20 people that have EVs that are included in this program. Um, and it includes a couple of students, uh, which I find really exciting. Um, <clears throat> it sort of operates on this community sharing principle where everybody has each other's contact information. And oftentimes these are level two chargers. So um, even an all electric vehicle can charge pretty quickly with these in you know, half of a work day, three or four hours tops. For the hybrid um, vehicles, you can charge in an hour to two. So designated, designating side-by-side -side parking spaces so that the charger can be moved from one vehicle to the other without having to move parking spaces um, has, has worked really nicely. There's no fee for, um, for charging on campus, but everybody does have to have a campus parking pass. <clears throat> And then we've had, um, there have been other successful initiatives, but we've had varying success. Um, we, two examples of that are um, two transportation initiatives that we've started. Um, one was the River Ferry and the other was the Intercampus Connector. So the River Ferry, um, <laughs> the way that this worked is um, the river, Saco River is, we're right at the mouth of the Saco River. Um, and a lot of our off-campus students live in, in Camp Ellis across the Saco River. And in order for them to get to campus, they have to drive nine miles up and over the bridge and then back down to, Bitterf to, to the Bitterford campus. Whereas if they went sort of as the crow flies right across the river, it's less than a half of a mile. So, this was an initiative that one of our en environmental faculty um, had, he'd heard some students complaining about having to get up and over the bridge as often traffic jams trying to get over the bridge. Um, and he sort of turned it into a student project and they surveyed off campus students about their desire to ride across the river. It was hugely popular um, with regular riders, um, but it was, and it ran for about three years, but we were never really able to get the ridership up to a point where um, it became cost effective. And there were other issues too, you know, there's liability concerns. So that was, that was one of the really expensive pieces of it. Um, you know, but also the Saco River freezes along the edges. Um, so we had to take our docks out in November and couldn't get them in often until April um, until you know, the, ri the river cleared its ice. So um, it was innovative and everybody sort of agrees that it was a great thing to try, um, but it wasn't necessarily um, cost effective. The Intercampus Connector enjoyed um, several more years popularity um, than the River Ferry, but again, um, we actually just ended this this past year. There's 22 miles between our Portland and Bitterford campuses. And it didn't, when we started, it really didn't have direct public transit options between the two campuses. So we contracted for a coach bus um, with, wi with Wi-Fi. Um, for four uh, round trips, Monday through Friday. Um, and like I said, it ran for about six years, but we've seen some um, better connectivity with public transit. So, um, and it's, that's evolving um, and ridership has stayed steady, but didn't increase enough for us to be able to justify it. And then there's some other um, initiatives that we have promoted um, through Environmental Council and um, haven't gotten funded. So. It's not all sunshine and roses. Um, we've been um, lobbying for a really large solar installation on our um, athletic complex. And we actually, on March 4th, we actually got approval from the Board of Trustees for a $650,000 solar installation. And there was celebratory cheers all the way around 
um, only to have that um, pulled away two weeks later when COVID hit and changed our financial picture. So, um, but, but we're gonna stick at it and um, as things improve, um, we're confident that, that that's gonna be approved again. So in terms of research and teaching, living laboratories, um, classes and faculty research often spark inspiration in students and they offer varied opportunities for exploration for sure. So some examples of this include um, the mosquito control project. This originated from concern over finding triple E and West Nile um, virus in the state and our public health folks were kind of freaking out about um, mosquitoes and wanting to protect our student athletes on our playing fields. Um, our soccer fields on the other side of it is there's a marsh and it's pretty buggy. Um, so they were talking about just spraying for mosquitoes and our environmental studies department and our environmental health and safety department, which is um, where my position is organized. We kind of said, you know, had this like, let's time out and, and talk about this a little bit more. And, you know, can we look at using natural predators instead to ch ch try to control the mosquito population? Um, and this resulted in um, sort of triple controls with um, pr providing habitat for birds, um, specifically tree swallows and eastern bluebirds and bats, which we have not been able to attract to our bat houses. Um, but we, um, we have a, a plan in place. And then um, installing repel, uh, mosquito repellent plants at the entrances of buildings and, and strategic locations around campus. This has been a really popular summer internship opportunity for students. Um, and then the next is a rain garden. Um, this was came about actually from a class that I taught in the environmental studies department. It's called um, the sustainability lab. And in 2014, we were examining um, sustainable stormwater management strategies. Um, and again, I wrote a grant um, to the main campus compact and had, had it funded as a collaborative um, project with an ecological restoration course and a citizenship course. And again, this provides great summer internship opportunities. We have a medicinal herbal garden that is on our Portland campus, and this is right outside of the College of Pharmacy building. Um, this was the sort of result of a semester long course in the College of Pharmacy um, called phytotherapy. And um, the students from that class actually planted the, the uh, medicinal herbs in the garden in the spring. The chestnut tree project is um, gaining popularity and we have a lot of students that have been interested in, um, in participating in this from internship positions and work study positions during the year. Um, we have a faculty member, um, Dr. Tom Clack, is working with the American Chestnut Foundation. Um, the American chestnut trees were an ecologically and economically significant species in the Eastern US. Um, until a pathogenic fungal blight was imported on um, some Asian chestnut trees in the late 1800s. So Dr. Clack is um, working with the American Chestnut Foundation to hybridize um, the American chestnut with a blight resistant Chinese chestnut. Um, and UNE has several nurseries on campus that for the hybridized chestnuts. Um, and then the last one that I wanted to highlight is the Edible Campus Initiative. And this is sort of a um, ad hoc um, project that myself and, and Jerry Fox, a, another faculty member and I have been working on for a number of years. And it's really just a collection of demonstration projects throughout campus um, that illustrate the power of growing food in marginal spaces. So many projects um, I, I have already talked about like the chestnut trees and a couple of that I'm going to mention in a, in a bit, um, the honeybee hives that we have on campus and, and an aquaponics lab. Um, but marine science faculty are also engaged in aquaculture projects, including seaweed farming. So it extends to the terrestrial and um, aquatic environments. And then student advocacy. <laughs> so this is where um, they can turn their learning into practice, right? 
Um, it comes in many forms. We've had um, you know, student petitions to well-reasoned and written letters of support for initiatives um, to using student funding to demonstrate that their willingness to, like I said before, sort of put their money where their mouth is. Um, and if they're, if they're willing to pony up financially um, for some projects, then it, it further demonstrates their um, desire to see some of these sustainability initiatives happen on campus. So the first one that I wanted to talk about is bird glass or bird safe glass. This originated from a conservation and preservation course um, that was taught by one of our environmental faculty. And they were learning about bird strikes at the same time that our brand new student commons was in the design phase. Um, and when they saw the, the early designs, they realized that the, it was in, intended to have the entire front facing um, wall, <laughs> essentially facing the Saco River be all glass. Um, so they started a petition on change.org and it was met with overwhelming support. Um, and our previous president, Dr. Ripich, was um, swayed by this and, um, and they did a quick pivot. And this was a very expensive pivot. <laughs> um, the price tag was um, close to a quarter of a million dollars. I you know, have questions about the sustainability of it because um, Ornolux bird safe glass is manufactured in Germany and shipped here, um, but it's proven effective. And since the, this building and, and what they decided to do was have the glass facing the Saco River because that's a prime migratory pathway um, to have just that one wall essentially um, be um, this Ornolux bird safe glass. But you can see in that lower picture there um, that what, what birds see and what we see, the birds don't perceive reflections, they only see you know, sky and tree in the window and they fly into them resulting in mortalities. But there's a UV pattern in the Ornolux glass that is visible to birds, but transparent to us. Um, so by creating that spider web of UV lines, the birds see the obstructions instead of just a reflection. So it's, it's very effective. And to my knowledge, the, the building is about three years old now and we haven't had any bird strikes on that, on that side that I'm aware of. Um, EV solar, this, um, this project actually came about because of a class that took a field trip and, and the class was an introduction to environmental issues and this is part of the core curriculum. So all of the students in the um, College of Arts and Sciences have to take this EMV 104 class. Um, but this one particular class took a field trip to Revision Energy, which is one of the largest solar installers in Northern New England. And when they arrived there, they saw an electric vehicle parked out front, um, plugged into an EV charger that was hooked up to solar panels on um, the roof. And this, this happened just after um, we had the EV chargers um, installed on campus. And so they wrote a letter to President Ripich and um, basically just you know, said, we've got these great EV chargers, they should be solar powered. And she agreed and, and funded two really small solar installations um, that are sized to theoretically offset the electricity demands from our um, electric vehicle charging stations on campus. And then um, student club activities. This is, <laughs> um, I think, a lot of where we see a lot of energy from, from students. Um, for sustainability. One of them was the Blueberry Garden. This was um, sort of a nice melding of the Edible Campus Initiative and um, a, a, a student club. It's called Earth's Eco. It's a, the, our student environmental club. So they sought approval from the president to put in this Blueberry Garden and it's in one of the most prominent locations um, of campus. It's right outside the president's office at um, the Compass Rose. It's a stone structure um, in, the, in the pavement and it's where it are, all of our admissions tours come through there and congregate. That's kind of a central hub of traffic. And there's interpretive signage next to these blueberry bushes. Um, so in, in other, you know, landscaping where 
you know, burning bushes are um, beautiful in the fall. They get super bright red, but they're also an invasive species. Um, but but blueberry, high bush blueberries look very similar um, and they provide a fruit in the summer, which is great. Um, so that that's, um, has been, was the, our very first sort of um, student led activity that had the Edible Campus Initiative in mind. Um, we also had student advocacy for a monarch butterfly garden. This is a great example of, you know, beauties in the eye of the beholder and our grounds folks um, struggle a little bit with, you know, they want manicured bark mulched um, gardens and some folks prefer that wild natural look. And this was an area that was hard won because it was um, allowing milkweed to grow up in a manicured garden. Um, but then we also have um, Honeybee Conservation Club has um, a, a couple of beehives on campus and we have the aquaponics club that grows um, edible plants. So we've got Swiss chard and kale and uh, basil and oregano and a few other herbs and salad greens that grow in the aquaponics lab as seedlings and then are transferred over to this picture is of the living wall in the commons and it's a super visible location. But basically all of these things um, add up to keeping stewardship in the forefront of the student body awareness and proving to the administration that they want to be surrounded by these demonstrations of sustainability. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and just say thank you so much for your attention and I wanna leave time for um, um, questions. So, and I know I didn't leave a whole lot of time. That's okay. Fred, Fred do you have any questions in the lecture hall? Um, I do have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So on the biodiversity side of sustainability, if I remember right, um, UNE owns a few hundred acres of forest land just south of uh, Pool Road, I think. Yep. It's called and the, we call it the um, New England Woods. It's also called the 369. And it's, uh, that's a, another great example. And like I said, there was no way I could cover everything, but um, it is used for um, teaching and learning as well as research. Okay. I, it's a prime habitat for blanding turtles, if I remember right, which is mm -hmm. listed in, in Maine. Do you guys um, use it for research or? Yeah, our environmental studies department especially uses that space. There's a bird banding station. We have um, two ornithologists um, in our faculty. Um, I'm not sure of any research that's going on for um, the turtles, but um, I know that we've had student interest in, in studying them in the past. And then we have another um, faculty member whose um, strength is in vernal pools. And they do a lot of um, research. And, and so there's 369 um, contiguous acres. Um, I think 107 of them or 109 of them are in um, conservation easement and protected through the um, Saco River Land Trust. Great. It's good to hear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, questions from Zoom land. So, so UNE is um, a private institution. Yes, a private nonprofit. I just, I'm just overwhelmed by all the stuff that that you guys do there. Um, it's just, I'm yeah. jealous. And I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> Derek says, "Oh, and Bill both have questions." So, okay, uh, Bill. By the way, uh, Bill is a diver. Alethea was a diver when she was. Uh, at Alfred. So I'll call on Bill first if you want to unmute yourself, Bill. That's awesome. Um, that's very cool that you were a diver. I think that this was a very awesome display of how many different facets and fields of study can intertwine and help uh, towards the goal of sustainability. How do you think this could be translated into other schools? And do you think with how much you know and how much 
you have going in different um, sustainability fields, would you be able to lead some sort of directive for other programs, other schools to do similar things that you're doing? Um, that's a great question. And I, I really feel strongly that it is about um, finding out where the energy exists and, and moving on that. So I could beat my head against the wall every day of the week if I was um, trying to just get solar into UNE. And we've had some small successes, but like I said, um, the, the solar um, installations that we have are relatively small compared to some of the other institutions in the state. Um, but there's been a tremendous amount of interest and support on sustainable landscaping and the Edible Campus Initiative. So we have these incredible demonstration gardens all over campus. And I mean, we have honeybee hives and um, we have this amazing living wall that can help us um, it, it's not so much about growing the vegetables, but, but demonstrating that vegetables can be grown indoors in a different sort of way than, you know, tillable agricultural land. UNE, um, like I said, we're at the mouth of the Saco River that opens up into um, the Gulf of Maine. Um, and we don't have, and we never will have most likely tillable agricultural land, but we can demonstrate the ability to grow food in all kinds of different niche ways. Um, and so, and, and that's where some of the energy from the student interest has been. Um, and so that's what I try to capitalize on. So I think the, the roadmap for how to get more sustainability initiatives on any college campus is to sort of listen to wh what people are interested in seeing and then um, trying to find um, ways to accomplish it, you know, what's feasible. They kind of call me the pragmatic environmentalist at UNE. So it's, it's always like, you know, trying to do this weighing and balancing of um, what is likely to happen. And I also look at it as this um, sort of healthy, vicious cycle of um, when we promote sustainability initiatives that we have on campus and and tell people about the good things that we're doing that we attract like-minded people to our campus and and then the more people that are interested in that kind of thing and are attracted to it they demand more because when they get there they're like yeah this is great but wouldn't it also be great if we had x y and z and so that increases the demand for it. So it, it's been a long process and I, I, won't, um, I won't, you know, lie and say that it's been easy, um, but it, it is iterative. So, and I think any campus um, can see that. It's just a matter of finding the interest and in starting small and then promoting the heck out of it, really, um, you know, publicizing every little victory that you have. Derek, did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Go for it. All right. So, um, if you, so say we were, so about the funding, like when you go about when you go about looking for uh, places for you guys to get funding, um, how do you approach that? Do you guys like, like write a letter, or do you guys um get like you know a petition, or how do you guys start uh you know looking trying to receive funding from like you know other organizations and groups? So are you talking about like grant funding or donations? Um, grant funding, sorry. Um, well, it's, it's a little bit easy. I don't know if there's anything similar in New York State, but in, in Maine, we have this thing called the Efficiency Maine Trust. And that has been the biggest pot of money that we've been able to tap into from a grant perspective. Um, and a grant application is, um, <laughs> It's honestly, it's very similar to a collection of essays that you have to put together um, and any kind of project proposal, um, you know, that includes a budget and um, justification and, you know, what your strategies are and, and project management stuff. So, um, yeah, you know, finding the organizations to write the grants to is probably the most challenging part of it. Um, and then, um, you know, and, and they're oftentimes very prescriptive in terms of what they're willing to fund. So 
finding, finding the right organization that matches up with the project that you want to do um, is, is challenging. And like I said, oftentimes the grant application announcements have a very short turnaround time. So you might have, you know, if you're really lucky, you might have like six or eight weeks to put a project together, which for a really big energy efficiency or renewable energy project is not enough time. So sometimes it's a matter of sort of having preparatory um, work done and have projects sort of like waiting in the wings so that you know that yes, you know, the, the building infrastructure for that building could handle um, solar panels and a snow load. Um, and so if a grant proposed or um, RFP comes out that is for a solar installation, um, you know, or, or this building has enough space in the mechanical room to house water storage tanks for a solar thermal system. And then, you know, finally, two years down the road, a grant um, application becomes available for a solar thermal system, then you know that that's the building that you're going to go for and, and be able to provide. So, so having, having sort of not shovel ready, but almost shovel ready projects sort of waiting in the wings so that you can find the appropriate um, grant opportunity to match up with that particular project is important because it's, it's unlikely that you're going to find um, a grant opportunity every time that matches up with the project that you have, you know, ready and that you're wanting to fund right away. Does that answer your question, Derek? Oh, uh, yeah. So it's, it's really all about, you know, just picking the certain, um, you know, the correct the correct organization, you know, and, you know, make a good, a great blueprint of what's going on before, before you get, take anything into action. Yeah, it's a lot of planning. And um, we have um, institutional advancement at UNE, and I'm sure it's called something different at every institution, but they're essentially the folks that go after um, alumni and donors and grant, um, eight granting agencies and, and they're good people to snuggle up with and get to know really well because they oftentimes will see things that come through their doors that say, oh, you know, this is, this is a great opportunity. You know, let's see what, who might have a project that matches. Um, so they're, they're good people to have on your side. Um, and we're lucky end. that one of ours is at this presentation today, Amy Jacobson, so thank you very Hi. much. Um, I have to bomb out here to go to another class, but I'm going to leave the meeting open. So if people have more questions or want to talk to Alethea, um, but I want let's uh, thank Alethea virtually with our hand clapping. <laughs> and um, next week uh, we have Aaron Latovsky who has been coordinating fire recovery for some of the big fires that took place in Australia earlier this year, uh, another alum. So um, Hope to see many of you at next week's. Again, I'm leaving the meeting, but you guys can stay. I just have to teach another class. Thank you very much, Alethea. Thanks, Michelle.